Well, good evening, church family. And, and I always start off by saying church family, and I mean the larger church family. All of my brothers and sisters in Christ, we have many people that watch our Wednesday night Bible study that are not actually part of our fellowship here at GBC, but you're part of our bigger umbrella family, uh, the family of God. So we're glad to have each and every one of you joining us tonight as we continue in our study in the book of Philippians. We'll be in Philippians, the first chapter. We'll be in verses 12 through 18, and we'll get there in just a minute. Tonight we're going to be looking at the joy of Paul's ministry. We have kind of divided it up in two parts, so we'll do part one tonight. We'll do part uh, two next week. And so as we look at this, uh, we continue to look at the very theme of the book of Philippians, which is joy in the life of a Christian. And one of the surest measures of Christian spiritual maturity is to see what it takes to rob a Christian of his spirit-filled joy. Uh, so in other words, uh, when you look at the life of a Christian, when you look at a believer's life, uh, what does it take to rob him of his spiritual joy? And so we're going to kind of look at that a little bit tonight because we realize that the more mature a believer in Christ is, the harder it is to take away that joy. But we're going we're gonna to look at that a little bit tonight. Paul, Paul's uh, maturity level was evidently uh, off the charts, as we would say, because uh, he made it very, very clear in the Scripture that it didn't uh, matter of the level of difficulty or unpleasantness or painfulness or life-threatening circumstances, nothing was going to rob him of his joy. And uh, as a matter of fact, this was the ironic thing as we study the book of Philippians, we find that not only could those horrible things, which we would look at many times as very difficult in our lives, not only were they not going to rob him of his spiritual joy, but they were actually going to increase his spiritual joy. Uh, and we realize that uh, where our joy comes from, it comes from God. God is the giver for believers. God is the giver of our spiritual joy. And as we might say in a continuation that God gives our spiritual joy as believers and our spiritual joy is administered to us through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.22 uh, I think it points out very well when it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. These are all traits that are fruits of the Spirit. And the only way we can have those is to be resting in Christ Jesus. So remember, when we talk about the fruits of the Spirit, we're talking about those things that God gives and the Holy Spirit administers to us. But we've, we've talked about and we've considered through, through our study the fact that uh, nothing uh, is going to rob us of our sin. But there is, as a believer, there is a certain amount of inconsistency in the level of our joy. 1 John 1, 4 tells us, it says, These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. May be made complete. You see, the only thing, and, and you might take note, write this down, the only thing that can steal your spiritual joy as a believer in Christ Jesus is sin. Sin in our life, because sin in our life corrupts the fellowship we have with Christ. In other words, sin in our life, when we have sin in life, unconfessed sin in our life, then that separates us to a certain extent. And the more sin and unconfessed sin, the more separation there is from our relationship with Christ. And the, the more gap there is in our relationship. We never lose our relationship. Remember that. But we can, we can put a gap. We can put a gap in our relationship because of sin. And when we do that, it can rob us of our joy. So sin is the only certainty 
in our life that can rob us of our joy as a Christian. Nothing else other than sin can actually rob us of our joy. And I think, I think uh, we see that in the life of Paul. And by the time Paul wrote this, the book of Philippians, Paul had experienced probably more serious hardship than we could, any of us could even imagine because he had gone through so many hardships of every sort, of every kind, and he dealt with those things with just spiritual joy in his heart. And so although he was not writing this epistle from a dungeon, he was in prison. Now, uh, he, he, was, he was chained, and this is, this is something I want to just take a minute for us to kind of mull over in our minds. Paul, now, he wasn't in a dungeon, but he was in prison, and he, he spent every minute of his day and night, 24-7, 365, as we would say, chained to a Roman soldier. Think about that for just a minute. He had no privacy when he ate. He had no privacy when he slept. He had no privacy when he, when he would try to write. He had no privacy when he prayed. He had no privacy when he preached, when he taught, when he had visits with his friends. He had nothing he did. 24-7 was not under the scrutiny of a Roman soldier who was chained to him all the time. Can you just imagine what it would be like to have someone attached to you all the time? Someone who was always watching everything you did, her listening to every word you said. You know, uh, as I thought about that, I thought that's kind of a scary thing because uh, many of us can put on our, our Sunday best put on our coat and ties or our special dress and our bonnets and and we we look pretty good and we can do that on Sunday and and sometimes we can do that even during the week and but sooner or later sometimes that that coat and tie's got to come off and that and that uh, front sometimes that we put up uh, falls and there's no facade anymore the facade that we put up is kind of falls down around us and the true us comes out and the true us is this we're centered remember that we none of us are perfect there was only one perfect person that was Jesus Christ none of us are perfect and so because of that we're all simply sinners saved by grace and sometimes the sinner comes out in us and you know what I'm talking about. You know when we don't act exactly like we should. We don't say things that are exactly like they should be. Uh, when we let that word slip or we let that action uh, come out in us, uh, we let that attitude appear. And, and th at those times, we wouldn't want anybody to see us. So can you imagine Paul, he's chained to this... But for Paul, it was ministry. For a period of two years, he went without any privacy whatsoever, chained to a Roman guard. And for him, what he thought of this was that it was a remarkable opportunity for himself. You see, he took it as a remarkable opportunity to show his Christ likeness. What a chance for him to be a witness. What a chance for him to show his Christ likeness. Now tonight I'm going to break the, the scripture text down into two parts. The first part I'm going to look at Philippians, the first chapter, verses 12 through 14. And I'm going to call this, in spite of trouble, as long as Christ calls progress. In other words, Paul didn't mind being in trouble. Nobody likes trouble, but Paul didn't mind being in trouble as long as that trouble would allow him to move forward the cause of the kingdom, to, to move along in Christ's cause, and that be progressing through whatever he was going through. 
You see, our life as a Christian is a life of progression. Nothing stays stagnant in our lives. We, we can't stay the same. We're not the, we're not, the only thing that's the same is Christ Jesus. The scripture says Christ Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That doesn't apply to us. We're, we're pretty variable in our actions. And so things don't always stay constant. But Paul wanted to make sure that in his life there was a constant progression of the gospel. So let's look at Philippians, the first chapter, beginning in verses 12 and going through 14. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, these are his brothers and sisters in Christ he's talking to at the church at Philippi, people who he loved, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Now I want you to, to picture this. He says that my circumstances... I'm in prison, I'm chained to a Roman soldier, and my circumstances have actually worked out for good. Now you say, how can these circumstances work out for good? How can trials, tribulations, and troubles in our life work out for good? Well, because that that came into Paul's life, he used to honor and glorify God. The things that come into our life, the trials, the troubles, the tri tribulations, the struggles that come our way, when we can use those things to honor and glorify God, that brings joy to our hearts and joy to the Father. He goes on to say, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Here's, this is neat right here. And we're, we'll kind of break it down a little bit in a second. But what he's saying is, he's saying, because I was chained to these guards, I want to make this real clear. What he's saying is that they had, <laughs> they had to put up with me day and night. They had to listen to me preach. They had to listen to me pray. They listened, had to listen to me be a witness I had the opportunity 24-7 to tell them about Jesus. So they had to listen. So because they had to listen, when they, when they were unchained from him, they took, soldiers took turns being chained in, they would go out in the community and guess what? They would tell everybody around them, hey, I was chained to Paul for 12 hours. I was chained to Paul to eight hours. And I got to listen to him preach. I listened to him. And man, he's got something. Man, he's special. Man, there's something about Paul that's different. Yeah, there is. It's the same thing that's different about you and me as believers. We have Christ in our life. That's exciting. That's exciting. You cannot even imagine how many countless Roman soldiers, Praetorian Guard, were whose lives were changed because they were cha chained up to Paul and they had no choice. You know, wouldn't it be great? As, as a preacher, I, I think sometimes I, I'd love it if my congregation was chained to the pew where they, could, where they just had to listen to me. They couldn't, they couldn't worry about uh, if dinner's getting overcooked or where I had to be or, you know, I've got 45 minutes, that's all I'm going to give you. What if they were chained to the pew and they had to listen to, to preaching all the time and praying all the time and, and the gospel all the time and the scripture all the time? My goodness gracious, that's exciting just to, just to think about that. It goes on, and the most of the brothers and sisters trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear because they see what's happening in my life, because they know what's going on, then they will also go out and share the gospel without fear. Romans 1, 14. Paul, Paul considered himself, <coughs> excuse me, Paul considered himself under absolute obligation from the, to the Lord to preach the gospel to everybody. The scripture says to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to everybody, not just to the Jew, but to the Greek, to the barbarian, the, the 
Every person that Paul came in contact with, Romans 1, 14 through 16. He, he, Paul writing here in Romans, he says, I am under obligation both to the Greek and to the uncultured, the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. In other words, to everybody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about your educational background. It doesn't matter about your socioeconomic background. It doesn't matter about anything. All that matters is I'm obligated. According to Paul, he says, I am obligated to preach the gospel. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Man, you know why he wants to preach it? Because he's not ashamed of it. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What Paul was saying, now listen to me closely. What Paul was saying is I have no choice, absolutely no choice. He's saying that this, this obligation was not just an obligation, but it was a, if I could use a different word, it was a compulsion with, with Paul. He had no choice. He was, there was a compulsion within him to preach the gospel. I don't, I don't have a choice to make here. I can't decide whether I want. And you know, that should be the same way with you and me, that we don't have a, a choice but to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't have a choice. We're compelled. There is a compulsion in our hearts and in our lives to share the gospel with people. A compulsion. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about, for I am under compulsion. I, not just an obligation. I don't have any choice. There's a compulsion in my life. For woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. What Paul is saying is I don't have any choice. And man, if I don't do it, I am going to be in trouble. Woe is me. Woe is me. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a balloon. You just keep putting air in a balloon, air in a balloon, air in a balloon, air in a balloon. Well, if at some point in time you don't start letting some of that air out, that, that balloon's going to pop. Well, that's the way it should be in a Christian's life. If a Christian is so full of the Holy Spirit, so full of the gospel, that if we don't share it, pretty soon we'll just explode. Explode. Have you ever been there? Have you ever just gone for a period of time and you didn't have anybody you could share the gospel with? Uh, if you've gone for a period of time and if you teach the Word, you hadn't got to teach. Or if you've gone for a period of time and you preach and you hadn't got to preach, man, it feels like you're going to explode. He says, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 23. He says, I do all things. This is why he has a compulsion to preach the gospel. This is why he has a compulsion to preach to pray, to witness. He says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I do everything I do because of the gospel, because of the good news. His ministry and his life were inseparable. In other words, he walked the walk. He talked the talk. His life looked like his ministry. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't one way on Sunday and another way on Monday. He wasn't one way uh, when he was at church and another way when he was at home. He wasn't one way when he was around Christians and another way when he was around non-believers. He was the same. His life and his ministry looked alike. Paul referenced... All the, all the pain and all the suffering and all the hardships that he went through, he really acknowledged them as unavoidable elements of ministry. In other words, those are things that he just knew he had to go through for his ministry to be successful, for his ministry 
to be complete. Matter of fact, in his own eyes, they were considered just a small cost that he was more than willing to pay because God used those trials in his life for furthering the progress of the gospel. Uh, the, thinking about Paul's ministry and thinking about uh, a, another preacher. Now, Paul, Paul preached him because he preached him because he proclaimed the word he was put in prison. And I, I thought about a Puritan preacher by the name of John Bunyan. Many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress. You know of John Bunyan and who he is and, and what he wrote. But because of his fervent preaching, because of his preaching the word, what happened to him? He was put in prison. The first time he was in prison, he was in prison for 12 years. Uh, he got out, then because he wouldn't quit preaching, they put him back in prison for a while. But what did Paul do when he was in prison? He wrote. He wrote, he wrote the word. What did, what did we find John Bunyan doing in prison? He wrote. He wrote a, a wonderful f book of fiction that is hard to even imagine that it's fiction. Uh, called Pilgrim's Progress. Next to the Bible, probably one of the books that's been printed. I think uh, I read something somewhere where it had been reprinted 250 times. Pilgrim's Progress, a book, uh, the main character in the book, you've probably read it, but if you haven't, it's a, it's a fictional story about a man named Christian. Now, Christian was... Living, have a, the whole process was going through a process in his life of how did he get from this world, which I believe was referenced as the city of destruction, how does he get from this world to heaven, was in essence where he was headed, and he was meandering through this life trying to go from this worldly life into his heavenly existence with the burden of sin weighting him down. The, in the book, Christian is referred to as the everyman. In other words, he's all of us. He's, the, he's just an example of who we all are. And isn't that, the, that our struggle, <clears throat> if you think about it? Our struggle is living in this life, and how do we get from this life to eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven? Well, the only way is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember that. There's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. So, we see this, uh, I think, a really perfect example in the life of John Bunyan, the Puritan preacher. And, and I think we can see that uh, demonstration of Paul. Paul's faithful perseverance not only was winning converts on the outside of the church, but it was strengthening encouraging believers within the church. And that's, that's what we need. We need to encourage each other inside the church so that we can win those lost on the outside of the church. So the implication is that before his imprisonment, believers were afraid or at least reluctant to openly share their faith. But once Paul was put in prison, once Paul was setting the example uh, for us, he was demonstrated far more courage uh, as he spoke and for us also. Now, Paul, the example he was setting for, for you and for me was that we, through his demonstration of courage by being in prison, allows the believer of his day as well as the believer of today to understand that our circumstances should not dictate uh, our understanding of our obligation to share the gospel. Okay, so secondly, I want us to look at in spite of detractors, as long as Christ's name was proclaimed. Now listen to what he says, Philippians, the first chapter, as we continue, verses 15 through 18. It says, 
Some, to be sure, are not preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking that they are causing me distress in my imprisonment. He's saying and some people are, are preaching the word based on what I'm doing as, as an example and a demonstrator of the word, and some are not. And some are, some are trying to be an encouraging encouragement to me, and some are trying to, to hurt me. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, but not only that, I will rejoice. What he's saying is, is there's some people out there that are, that are preaching the word under, under false circ, circumstances and, and, and with a, a, a false agenda. And others are preaching the word, but the word is the word. The word is the truth. And the scripture says that that word will not come back void. In other words, that word has meaning. That word has strength. That word has saving power. Like, like the Lord during his earthly ministry, Paul had more than his share of distractors, most of them from the Jewish and pagan religious establishment. Those were his distractors. This, the church soon came under uh, this, these distractors and Within its own ranks, the church was having problems. And, and you had those leaders who were maligned, like Paul, even though he was preaching the word, and those that followed him was preaching the word. They were often maligned by other preachers, so-called preachers and teachers, because of their steadfastness, because of their uh, steadfastness to the word. One of the most discouraging things, and I think this was Paul had a hard time with this. One of the most discouraging things is when your peers or so-called peers, uh, then they choose to malign you as a preacher, as a teacher, as a believer. They malign you. Have you ever had someone criticize who you were, what you were trying to, to do, what I have never in my life seen a time in our society, specifically in our country, the United States of America, where more people were trying to undermine and malign the church by undermining and maligning God's people than today. No matter what I say, it's, I speak the truth, I'm told, the world's told it's false. You speak the truth, the world says it's false. I speak what's right, the world says it's wrong. There's never been a time when we have come under such attack, <clears throat> come under such condemnation, come under such ridicule and persecution than today. Paul's distress was not due to his affliction. It wasn't due to being his imprisonment. It was due to the hypocrisy of those that spoke evil about him. Paul was fully aware that immature believers are prone to strife, to jealousy, to anger, to temper tantrums, to disputes, to slander, to gossip, to arrogance, to disturbances. Does that sound like where we're at? Think about it for just a minute, folks. Everywhere you look today, people are angry. People are upset. People are angry at each other. Think about what I just said. Immature believers and unbelievers are prone to strife and jealousy, angry tempers, Disputes, slander, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. Does that sound like, turn on the news, folks. Does that sound like where we're at? Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 12 and 20. 
It says, for I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish. In other words, I'm, at some point in time, I'm going to get, hopefully get out of prison. I'm going to get a chance to come back and see you. And my, my heart is heavy for the fact that when I come back, I may not find you like I wish you to be. How does he wish them to be? He wishes them to be in concert with his heart. His heart's in concert with the Lord's heart. He wants to find them doing the Lord's work in the Lord's way. He goes on to say, And may be found by you to be not what you wish, that perhaps there will be strife and jealousy and anger and temper, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disturbance. Perhaps that's what I'm going to find. He warned Timothy to be on guard against anyone in the church. He said in 1 Timothy 6, 4, He is conceited and understands nothing, but he has sick cravings for controversial questions and disputes about words from which come envy, strife, abuse, language, and evil suspicions. It just seems like everybody is trying to make everybody else angry. Everybody's trying to dispute everybody else. Everybody's trying to, to just have their own way, doing their own thing, and it doesn't matter who it hurts or it doesn't matter about the circumstances. And that's where we're at today. The cause of Christ was utmost in Paul's life. The cause of Christ is the cause to serve. The reason we serve is because of our relationship with Christ. God's Word is always powerful, no matter what the motives of the one who proclaims it. God's Word. So those that are out there, remember, it's kind of like I've said many, many times before. Our world is in a mess, but I've read the book. Not only have I read it, but I've read it to the end, and I know how it ends. And no matter what struggles we go through, no matter what situations we go, go through, as Paul, who found joy even in the midst of all the trials and troubles and tribulations, I can do the same thing because I've read the book and I know how it ends. Guess what? You and I win. As believers in Jesus Christ, the world can't take that away from us. We are winners in every sense of the word. So it doesn't matter what we go through. It doesn't matter what you're going through today. It doesn't matter what you're going through with your trials, struggles, tribulations, whatever they are. Understand and remember joy in our life is given to us by God, is administered by the Holy Spirit, and the only thing that can separate us from that is sin in, a, in our own life. And guess what? In the end, we win. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you. I hope the Lord puts someone in your path this week that you can share Jesus with. God bless.